very good evening to all of you uh, here from india and uh, 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 let let me set the tone for this particular panel discussion so uh, uh, particularly uh, even today most of the people who land up doing pg in community medicine uh, they land up there by chance and not by choice and uh, because of that uh, they uh, remain confused souls uh, even after they complete their pg uh, which way to go which way not to go and uh, uh, we thought that if there are uh, people who have already traded that path and who have established themselves uh, after doing uh, md in community medicine uh, if such people can share their own career journey their own words of wisdom uh, nothing like that to uh, motivate the uh, uh, young postgraduates and young professionals so that is how this entire uh, idea of panel discussion came and uh, it's a pure privilege to have uh, uh, this uh, such a panel with us already i can see all the four panelists in a row uh, dr hemant kulkarni sir uh, dr kishor madhwani sir uh, dr surendra shastri sir and uh, dr sharin sir and uh, 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 i'm sure dr arvind mathur sir will also join us in uh, some time uh, so we'll start uh, and we have uh, uh, dr rajesh kumar sir uh, uh, who is uh, the ex professor and head of uh, department of community medicine from pgi chandigarh Uh, sir is available to us as the uh, moderator and uh, dr chandrakant lahariya sir who is the uh, npo currently for the health systems uh, for the country uh, he is available as a co moderator uh, uh, so what we will do is uh, we'll uh, introduce first panelist uh, we'll allow them to talk and when the next uh, person uh, has to talk just before that we'll introduce that particular uh, panelist if uh, if that is permitted sir sure Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, I'll uh, like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Surendra Nath Shastri, sir. Uh, uh, sir is, is currently working as a professor of uh, in health disparities research, division of cancer prevention and population sciences at University of Texas, uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center, uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, he was ex professor head at department of preventive oncology at tata men hospital uh, mumbai uh, he was also working with the who collaborative center for cancer prevention screening and early detection at the tata memorial center and uh, personally uh, while uh, i was doing my post graduation in km i could learn a lot from sir himself and to us uh, we equate his name with preventive oncology as long as the work for preventive oncology in our country is concerned extensively his areas of interest are cervical cancer breast cancer uh, tobacco attributed cancers and he has published in almost all leading journals you name the journal and uh, he has published in uh, that particular journal uh, he is a recipient of uh, who director general special award for outstanding contributions to tobacco control among youth uh, this happened in may 2008 apart from that he has international achievement award from the american cancer society for demonstrating outstanding leadership in global fight against cancer uh, he has also been awarded with the prestigious humanitarian award from the american society of clinical oncology and uh, hugh bauer award for the society of gynecological oncology uh, usa in february 2014 uh, yeah. he has been invited to speak at the united nations uh, in june 2014 uh, it's a pure privilege sir to have you and we look forward to uh, you sharing pearls of wisdom from your own journey and uh, over to you sir for next 15 minutes thank you very much uh, vishesh i'm uh, extremely privileged uh, to be speaking to such a wonderful audience and particularly uh, some people who i you know look up to like uh, dr garg so uh, I, i would uh, you know without any uh, further and uh, firstly uh, please pardon my uh, dressing because it's early morning out here and uh, you know i have yet to start my day so uh, just one question uh, am i allowed to share slides or uh, i can just speak uh, you can share slides but i don't see I... a share option it is not uh, lighting up for me you know the share option I'll just give a moment sir we'll share the presenting rights with you okay okay thank you yes sir yes sir in the meanwhile uh, 
I think uh, all of us are uh, battling with the coronavirus situation. I think that's uh, yeah. Yeah. an amazing opportunity, although it's unfortunate, but it's an amazing opportunity for a lot of things, particularly in uh, prevention. Okay, I'll just share my... Are you able to see my uh, slide? Yes. Okay, so let me get started because I, I heard you saying in the beginning that you would like to you know, finish these talks in about 12 minutes. And then of course we have the panel discussion uh, finally, yeah. So to begin with, I uh, did my MBBS from uh, the, the MGIMS, where, which is hosting the, the current uh, a session and the, the current IPSM. Uh, you can see me, right? You can see the uh, slides, right? Yes, yes, we can see okay. the slides. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know, for some reason, I, I was uh, always a student who enjoyed extracurricular activities, used to uh, represent MJMS uh, and Nagpur University in table tennis and cricket and we have uh, sargam so uh, i was uh, you know uh, the conductor of sargam for a long time so with all those things most uh, teachers used to think that uh, i'm not interested in studies however i graduated with the uh, highest in psm and uh, i had uh, the second uh, highest in obstetrics and gynecology and as also among the top five in most subjects through mbbs however my first choice was surgery. It was not PSM. The, the, obviously, for reasons that uh, you know, for those branches are considered to be much higher. But during my time, we had to first do two. We call them not residency, but house jobs. Six months house job in uh, two turns, and then only we could apply for a post graduation. So I did uh, surgery. Was not interested. Did internal medicine, was not interested, wanted to experiment further, did intensive care and even skin and beauty. Before I finally turned to PSM, so it's a conscious choice. It's not because, you know, I was not getting anything else or, uh, you know, I didn't. I went through all those steps to find out what is it that I'm really interested in? What, what is it that would probably provide maximum benefit to a maximum number of people? So then, I was basically from Mumbai, so I came back to Mumbai and I did my DPH and MD from the St. G.S. Medical College, uh, standing first in Mumbai University in both. That time it was Mumbai University, there was no MUHS. I also did the hospital administration from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, because a alternative career for uh, PSM people at that point of time. And again, it was called preventive and social medicine, not community medicine as it is called now. I think Dr. Rajesh Garg was the one who started this whole uh, terminology and concept of community medicine, which is correct. So, uh, so alternative career was to get into administration. So uh, I did the hospital administration from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. And then I worked for some time as a lecturer, then as an associate professor in the department of uh, PSM at the St. G.S. Medical College. And around 1997, there was an opportunity, which I was in two minds to whether I should take it up or not. The Tata Memorial Hospital, which is just across the road from uh, uh, KM Hospital and St. G.S. Medical College, had received a large amount of funds to set up cancer prevention services, and they wanted to set up a department of preventive oncology. And I was in two minds whether I should you know, leave this comfortable, uh, uh, you know, St. G.S. Medical College. It is, it's a municipal corporation of Mumbai job, uh, pension payable, and so many benefits, whether I should leave that, or I should take up the challenge of setting up this new department of preventive oncology and, uh, you know, go forward and see what we could do out there. So it took almost six months, although post interview I was selected, it took, so, took almost six months of uh, discussion with the director of the Tata Memorial Center at that point of time to then finally decide that, yes, this is what probably uh, is my future. 
So while I did that, I also held a joint position of the director of the Southeast Asia WHO Collaborating Center for Cancer Prevention, Screening and Early Detection, which also opened up a lot of avenues for me. So all this while I was doing teaching, I was doing clinical service, and I was doing research. Again, mark the fact that I was doing clinical service, and this was only possible because I had done clinical residencies. I had done clinical house jobs. So I would suggest that every person who's done PSM, who wants to do PSM, should not neglect clinical service part. So they should also equip themselves with clinical knowledge, with clinical skills, so that they, at any point of time, can stand up, discuss, challenge, show their skills to any of their clinical colleagues. You don't need to feel that you don't know clinical medicine. Yes, yes of course, we are MBBS doctors and we will know clinical medicine. Only thing is, we need some experience out there and we should go and get ourselves uh, equipped with that. The other important part that comes to our particular subject is research. This is something that can make a huge difference in the life of uh, people. And that's the whole purpose that I took up PSM because we could make a difference to the lives of a large number of people. So during this part, what I did was I conducted large cluster randomized trials in Mumbai, in Marathwada and Konkan region of Maharashtra. In fact, some of these studies go up to 20 years. So public health is not something which you can, you know, like small clinical studies, which are funded by pharma, no, no, no pharma funds uh, public health studies. So these are not studies uh, which can be just conducted with 40 patients and uh, you have your results uh, in two months and you publish. This is something that comes up with hard work and with consistency. So I did three to four large cluster randomized trials. Two of them are still ongoing. And these trials actually turned out to be landmark. Maybe I was lucky or maybe the people who mentored me really uh, put me on track to things that, that would have an impact. And these are paradigm changing research studies. So those research studies, uh, maybe at some other point of time, uh, I would be happy to uh, present to you. But in very short, I can tell you that uh, one of the studies that I did was for cervical cancer screening. As we all know, the cervical cancer screening, the norm, the standard, was pap smear screening and pap smear screening was not possible in countries like India and most developing countries because we don't have the manpower, we don't have the kind of laboratories which required, which is required for doing population-based pap smear screening. So we looked at an alternative, which is VIA, visual inspection with acetic acid. And also another alternative that is HPV DNA testing. So both these studies turned out to be landmark such that um, one of those studies, you know, this, if you look at this, uh, this part, the ASCO 2000, so ASCO is a meeting of clinical doctors, clinical oncologists, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Most of the studies they have are clinical studies. So this was probably the first time that a study from India, a oncology study from India, was taken at the plenary session. That's the first session. That's the opening session. You have just three uh, plenaries and each of those speakers are selected after a thorough selection of all the presentations that have been submitted. So for the first time, a study from India and that too a public health study from India was selected for a ASCO plenary. And after the presentation, and ASCO has a membership and every year, I still attend ASCO every year and every year between 40 to 45,000 people attend ASCO. So you have this large uh, McCormick uh, uh, conference place in Chicago and they have contracted Chicago for another 20 years. So that's the only place that can hold that large a gathering. And after the talk, a totally unprecedented, never happened before, has never happened after that. I had a standing ovation for almost three minutes from all the people uh, standing there. So like my wife, who's also from uh, Sevagram, who's also a student of Sevagram, uh, Jayanti Shastri, like she says that you're probably the second person uh, speaking in Chicago who got a standing ovation after uh, Swami Vivekananda. Of course, I don't claim to be anywhere uh, like that, but this was outstanding achievement for somebody from India 
this is outstanding achievement for somebody from uh, you know from uh, preventive and social medicine to do something like that uh, this has also changed the cervical screening guidelines globally so most of the developing countries including india now we have population based via screen and in the developed countries they have changed from pap smear to population based hpv dna screen so that way the guidelines have changed in fact now i chair the uh, uh, the uh, cervical cancer screening guidelines committee of asco so that that's a big honor and because of the kind of work that i was doing because of the kind of work that i had an opportunity to do i received research funding from the national institutes of health including r01 r01 is a, the most prestigious grant that the nci or the national institutes of health give and it's the toughest grant to get so despite which i had three consecutive r01 grants the bill and melinda gates foundation funded our marathwada study the american cancer society funded some of my studies the bloomberg philanthropy is funded the smoke free mumbai program that i directed i received research funds from the who the indian council of medical research the department of biotechnology science and technology and department of atomic energy so all these was because of the kind of work that we showed so first you have to demonstrate that you are capable of doing studies two you have to demonstrate that you are able to get good results which are going to change the lives of people again because of all this kind of work i received some very good award of course uh, you know uh, life and god have been uh, very kind to me and i have met some really really good people uh, through my journey so the very prestigious humanitarian award from asco only indian to have received that award so far uh, the who director general's award which uh, abhishek just mentioned then the american cancer society's international leadership award and was invited to speak to the united nations in preparation to the development of the sustainable development goals so the whole purpose of this was that invited about five or six speakers from all over the world to talk to the un representatives the people who were going to vote at the end of the day to the sustainable development goals so they had to be informed with good science and with good evidence as to what was good and how we could take this forward so that was again a great honor i also had the honor of serving as a consultant and many people in the panel here have had the, that honor of serving as consultants for the world health organization in the southeast asia region in the eastern mediterranean region in the asia pacific region and the africa region countries so that also expanded my horizons a lot i could meet a lot of people interact with a lot of people and we could set up a lot of multi center multi country studies some of those studies are still ongoing i served on the united nations missions and the international atomic energy uh, programs in africa so most of this program everything has to do with public health everything had to do with cancer prevention and uh, currently i serve as professor of health disparity research so how did i come here uh around uh, 2018 uh, i got a job offer from the md anderson cancer center again because of the interactions because of the uh, you know relationships we had built up uh, over the years i got this inv invitation from the md anderson cancer center the division of uh, cancer prevention and population okay. sciences saying that we are having a position here for uh, a professor of health disparities research would you be interested uh well again i like to move on in life and unless you move on in life you don't see new things our tendency basic mindset in india is once you have a set job remain there for your lifetime somehow i feel that that's that's not a good thing to do you need to move on you need to learn new things you need to meet new people and only then you can open new opportunities of course there there is also an incentive here that both my children had now uh, one uh, is a doctor from uh, the lokmanya tilak medical college uh, aditi shastri she is also an oncologist now uh, working in new york married uh, has children the younger uh, daughter of mine uh, did engineering and uh, did mba from columbia university she is also in new york married so that was a great incentive for uh, me to uh, come to the united states and 2018 i came over and joined as a professor of health disparities research so 
when I came here, I realized that the disparities that we see in India, the diversity that we see in India, we see in the US too. And in the last two years, I think the whole world has seen how divided the United States is, how much diversity is there, how much disparities are there. So there is a great opportunity to work again on disparities. I continue to work on smoking cessation in the Latino population and in the African American. I continue to work for uh, breast cancer screening. I continue to work for cervical cancer screening and moving over uh, now to uh, see whether we can uh, help the Latino population and the African American population with self uh, sampling of HPV DNA. Uh, those are the kind of studies that I'm doing again, uh, being funded by uh, the NIH. So the, that's again uh, creating newer avenues and uh, creating newer connections and you know taking me to different places. So even uh, now where I have completed almost uh, 35 years of uh, working, I continue to see new things. So you learn new things, you see new things, new op uh, opportunities open to you. You understand different things and you can still continue making a big difference to the lives of people. And uh, I, be, I continue to serve on the cancer prevention, the health equity, and the tobacco control committees of the ASCO. And just like I mentioned, I chair the cervical cancer screening committee, uh, guidelines committee for uh, ASCO. So that uh, is where I am at present. And I'm going to stop here and uh, we'll uh, tag the next uh, speaker. And at the end of everyone, if I'm um, correct, like Abhishek suggested, we, and Dr. Garg suggested we would uh, have uh, the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it's really inspiring to hear to your journey, and I'm sure it would uh, uh, inspire the younger generation as well uh, to walk in your footsteps. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shastri, for sharing your journey. How do I stop? Uh, yeah, stop sharing. One sec. Stop my sharing. Okay. Has my sharing stopped? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. No. Thank no. You. No. Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. Not sir. yet. Okay. Okay. Not stopped. Now it has. Sir. Yes. Now it has. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 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 So, Dr. Shastri, once again, thank you very much for reminding all of us that in our discipline, teaching, clinical work, and research, if combined together and consistently follow a particular topic, then, you know, one can make a mark and impact on public health practice as you have done. So thank you very much. And now over to Abhishek for the yes. next speaker. Uh, Dr. Arvind, sir, have you joined us? Yes, he yes, has. Yes, Abhishek. Has. I... Yeah. Yeah. Welcome, sir. Yeah. So uh, we thought we'll alternate between speakers from US and this part of uh, the world. Uh, uh, just to keep the balance. So it's a pure privilege to uh, welcome and introduce uh, Dr. Arvind Mathur, sir. Uh, uh, sir is a uh, alumni of LLRM uh, Medical College in Merak. And after his post graduation, uh, uh, he has worked with many international organizations, including Aga Khan Foundation, uh, Care International, uh, Human Nutrition Unit. Uh, he has also worked with the Human Nutrition Unit of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, India. and. Uh, uh, to us, uh, he has, uh, I mean, we have always uh, watched him work as the WHO representative. Previously, he was working in Maldives. Now, he's working as the WR in Timor-Leste. And uh, 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 our department has a special uh, association with uh, Arvind, sir. And uh, we look up, always look up to him and try to learn from him. So, welcome, Arvind, sir. And we look forward to uh, hearing from you. Arvind, sir, over to you. Yeah. 
so you are not audible hello hello Think, uh, we can see him. Sir, I think you are on mute. Uh, well, I have got out of the iPhone, so I am now. Connected on the laptop, so we can hear we you can... very well, sir. Yes, and we can even see you. All right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Technology, <laughs> great. Thanks. All right, Abhishek, over to you. Sorry for this. Yes, sir. Uh, so we just uh, finished introdu introducing you, sir, and we look forward to hear from you. Oh, great. Thank you so very much uh, and uh, very, very good morning. Good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Uh, the technology was just uh, defying uh, uh, the other corner of the world uh, uh, where I am right now, uh, heading the WHO office in East Timor. Uh, and it's been really a pleasure and privilege to see and hear uh, Dr. Suryan Shastri uh, after like long, many years. Uh, so I certainly wouldn't come to the laurels that Dr. Shastri uh, has uh, mentioned and shared and achieved. Uh, so first and foremost, I wanted to congratulate him uh, and also, you know, like want to thank Professor Gurg, uh, Dr. Subodh and Abhishek and everyone else uh, from the Sevagram who have uh, organized this, uh, this itself, a youth conclave, which is uh, beyond the beaten path. Uh, so heartiest congratulations for thinking out of the box and certainly doing something uh, uh, which I'm sure not only be, uh, you know, like inspirational to the to the younger people, uh, but also motivational to our peers uh, and also to the people that we always look up to who have mentored us. And I saw Dr. Rajesh Kumar as well. Uh, so it's been really, a, really a great um, uh, time for me to be joining you people. Uh, I understand that the whole idea is to talk about um, how different um, could one be when one is one is uh, had taken a career in uh, social and preventive medicine, as uh, was stated briefly, or the preventive and social medicine or community medicine. And I can say for sure, in one way or the other, uh, that one needs to start um, uh, with with a very basic premise of loving your speciality. And I have been one person who have felt that the field of medicine in any speciality has the widest and the most, uh, you know, amazing amount of scope. So whether one does uh, either clinical or one is into the community medicine or any of the names that we can, that itself shows the vastness and the variability and the diversity of the speciality and the subject actually. Uh, the second thing which I wanted to share with the people and everyone uh, who are connected online today um, is to say is to believe in yourself. Uh, you know, like you are in a speciality which is vast, which is diverse, uh, which can offer you huge potential exploratory options and opportunities. And please do believe in yourself. And the other thing which should be kind of there inside is to also look into uh, what I say that um, uh, as was stated that when you are going through this journey, if age is not on your side, let the knowledge be. And that's where I believe you would hear from many of us uh, who have done and who have started off um, uh, with a very, you know, like kind of an approach of going through the post-graduation or an MD uh, in social preventive medicine, uh, or have moved from the clinical side to the public health, but have also gone about doing some other concurrent parallel, be it management, be it hospital administration, uh, be it sometimes the computer scope, uh, clinical, uh, non-clinical skills, kind of computer skills and so on and so forth. Because one thing is very important. In our branch, if you have to really excel, 
you should believe that you need to be different. And that's something which is what I learned throughout my journey as I got my mentored when I decided to, um, you know, like kind of uh, not as um, uh, intellectually kind of uh, looking into when uh, friends like Dr. Subodh who have completed MD pediatrics and then decided to uh, pursue the career in community medicine. I decided to leave uh, clinical pediatrics much earlier and then decided to pursue the MD uh, in from LLRM Medical College, Meerut, and completed it from the Meerut University. And one thing which was very, very clear to me that if I need to be really different and if I need to be really excelling, uh, one thing which is there is learning, learning, and learning. And alongside the learning, you know, like grab the opportunities uh, which would come your way to see the practical aspect of preventive and social medicine. Uh, you know, like go beyond the boundaries of the rooms and the walls and the institutions and really be uh, with the people. And the reason why I keep saying it as an example, because that contributed to my learning the maximum uh, by being close to communities, by close to people okay. is where the okay. where our laboratory is. That's our operation theater. That's where it, it's our ICU. So, and, and it doesn't need to be only in the faraway rural areas or villages, even within the compound, within the four walls of the institution as well, is our laboratory, is our uh, kind of a learning skill lab in a way to learn the, the community medicine. And I've been very, very fortunate uh, where, you know, like as was stated earlier as well, that I got mentored by a number of, uh, number of stalwarts in public health, not necessarily only the people who were teaching me in my medical institution, but also every time I've had the chance and opportunity to interact uh, with the whole galaxy of public health professionals. And I come across and I came across a number of people who were in clinical medicine or a clinical uh, field practicing public health. So I think the point that I want to reiterate, it is very important to build the diverse knowledge uh, in relation to be it your hardcore community medicine principles, but also the clinical skills on one side and the research and other operational skills, the management, managerial, the communication, the leadership skills. Uh, I continued and carried on my learning where I was put into, at times, like thrown into the ocean to swim. So whether it was designing the surveys, whether it was looking into carrying out the field studies or interacting with the, uh, with the agencies, whom we were looking at that point of time as the one that one would aim to join, uh, likes of WHO, UNICEF, and the people who were coming and supporting us, uh, networking, relationship building, and all of that, the art and science of this needed to be learned and absorbed, and that's what one did. Uh, I was very clear during that period of time that uh, if I really have to make an impact on a larger number of people, uh, I need to work at a policy level. And mind you, I have to tell it repeatedly, consciously to myself, because one of the most exciting and one of the most um, glamorous speciality within community medicine is actually teaching. And I have an inherent passion of teaching. So I need to keep telling myself that, no, I need to go uh, beyond this and I need to be working at a policy level. I need to get into the, uh, the international health. And that's been something, a struggle that I have had during the three years of MD. And then I decided that in order to go further, I need to further look into whether it was, uh, you know, like understanding further on the community side, looking into the research. When I joined one of my other mentors, Professor Omesh Kapil in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in the Human Nutrition Unit, where I, I learned the research on one side, but the community-based uh, approaches over there through the research uh, lens that one could learn. But again, I was reminding myself that that's not the place where I would be, and I don't need to get tied up with the programs. So I went from there to looking into the options and explore it, and I was fortunate again, God has been kind, and the teacher's blessings have always been something which has really made it, because one thing which I have learned, that one of the best teachers that I know of together, you know, all of them, they have always shown us where to look, but they have not tell, told me what to do and what to see. And that's your exploration. And that's very important. I mean, it beat my professors, including Professor Gerg, 
and the teachers in Meerut Medical College, they've always mentored me like this. So I was fortunate that I went into, you know, like Care International. That was my first international uh, job or, uh, you know, like international agency. I still decided to stay back in India as a hardcore young public health professional. I wanted to contribute. I got onto one of the difficult states at that point of time. And you would remember, I'm talking about mid 90s when we were still talking about Bimaru states and empowered action group. And I choose to be in the state of Bihar as their first uh, care, uh, you know, administrator and a state coordinator for first ever program of nutrition and health. And mind you, during that period, it was intense programming. And I could say based on my learnings at that international agency, but working at a grassroots level, working at a government level on one day, I was with Anganwadi workers down in a village, working at an ICDS with my team of around 120 field officers. But the next day I was sitting with the minister or the health secretary or the woman and child development secretary. So under the tree on one day and in the five star hotel on the other day, that's the diversity of public health, that's the diversity of community medicine. I can share only two good example of that journey. What had brought the policy level change? We had a commitment in the state of Bihar from care that we will take the measles coverage, immunization coverage from the then 10% in the Bihar state to 60%. And I started looking into where the vaccines are and little did one realize that the measles vaccine was not being delivered timely. The second thing was same way the iron folic acid coverage was committed from 7% in the pregnant mothers and adolescent girls to be taken to 74%. And iron folic acid was not supplied for a period of three years to the state of Bihar from the central level. And I initiated that dialogue from the grassroots, taking it to the policy level where the consultations were held and the entire policy in terms of the distribution chain was reviewed and revised. And the care became the first international partner with the Ministry of Health as an international NGO to be dealing with such policy matters. Same way, you know, like from care in the, in the state of Bihar, I could actually work with the, uh, with the corporate. And it was possible for us to facilitate the first corporate partnership with an international NGO, but then the Tata Steel Rural Development Society in the city of Jamshedpur in the erstwhile undivided Bihar, we became the first partner to collaborate with the civil society or the corporate social wing of uh, uh, the big uh, conglomerate. And, you know, like during whole of this thing, we have worked in the areas which were Nexalite affected, you know, like on one side dealing with those uh, kind of challenges in the community. And on the other side dealing, you can imagine in Bihar with the state of politicians and the bureaucracy and also integrating the, the whole health aspect because that's when we talk, we experimented and piloted with WHO, care WHO partnership with regard to the ARI and, you know, like uh, the, the diarrheal disease control program, which actually later on led to the integrated management of childhood illnesses, the whole uh, module development later on. And we, we piloted that in the state of Bihar. And I, you know, like as uh, luck would have had it, having spanned like around two years I was, for some reasons, I decided to explore further options. That's the time around when the WHO came to, um, you know, launch the ever, first ever big eradication program of polio eradication around 97, 98. And who would not have wanted to join WHO at that point of time and join the disease eradication program? And again, a kind of a dilemma where I had to tell myself there is a lot more to learn still, and it is probably better to explore avenues where you continue to learn in different fields. And having worked in the in the health system in, in, in Bihar, having worked with the, you know, like from policymakers to the grassroots level, I was very sure that I need to continue my learning. So instead of joining the polio program, which I was very much uh, included, I was very much there, I had an opportunity to join another international agency called Aga Khan Foundation. And that's where, you know, like I would say it was a new challenge. I had to break my comfort zone. And I tell you, friends, the young colleagues of mine, that we need to get out of our comfort zone. We need to get out of, 
you know, like that uh, thing which we are, that rut that we are into. And we need to define our successes ourselves. We don't need to define successes what others are doing. It is us who have to define. And that's where I felt I was so fortunate to have made that decision, looked into the health system development, the first time started talking about alternate health financing. I mean, in those days, I mean, even in the community medicine today, it's a struggle to talk about health financing and, and bring that concepts into teaching and into applications and to learning. And that's why this debate about the, the whole masters in public health and the community medicine keeps coming back and forth. The best of the things which happened to me during the Aga Khan Foundation and beyond the beaten paths was the example that the Seva Gram Institution actually itself provided. Uh, while I come out of the Merit Medical College and little did I realize that Professor Gerg, who was leading a partnership program with a bilateral donor, I've never heard of an institution leading a PBOH2 program. And that provided an opportunity for Aga Khan Foundation to also partner with Seva Gram. We were a grantee, a matching grant grantee with the USAID. And I kind of first time uh, kind of travel to Sevagram, where we actually launched and, and, and have had the management in primary health care. The whole concept of primary health care, improving efficiency, effectiveness, looking into the results-based management, all of that was actually tested, grounded. Even the faculty was trained and developed through the Sevagram initiative that we as Aga Khan Foundation felt immensely proud of. There, the learning again, I mean, I still remember the Kurjari village where I have interacted with the women, with the teams, because I have learned maximum from the community, from the, from the people in the field, where we first did the self-help group and linking it up with the health, linking it up with the income generation, which gave me the concept, we call it as a watershed concept at the Aga Khan Foundation at that time, which resulted into a concept which was called self-help health group. And then we took it up in terms of implementing that with the, with the Aga Khan Rural Support Program, the Aga Khan Health Services, and the Aga Khan Planning and Building Services. And not only that, we linked it with health, we were actually linking it with climate change and environmental health. We had an, a huge initiative where I learned first time why the girls are not attending schools, because there are no toilets. And during the menstrual monthly menstrual cycle, they would be absent. And I'm talking about one of the very developed states in India in Gujarat, where we were working, where we actually then launched the entire initiative of the school health uh, program, of the school sanitation, as well as the household sanitation program, where we learned the art and science of the, you know, the entire participatory rural appraisal, the voices of the women, and so on and so forth. The whole idea of this sharing with you is this that basically, uh, you know, there is a lot to learn around and the journey of ours that we are bringing and sharing with you is just like a story, but this is what had happened. Because from here, I could learn something further that we can actually think about an area development. So health, education, planning, housing, you know, like looking into small initiatives on water quality, which led me to develop a program with the Aga Khan Foundation, which was called the Area Development Program for Mewat area. And I know some people would be aware about Mewat, which is just two hours away from mm -hmm. Delhi, which is part of Rajasthan and part of Haryana. And the first ever area development program was led by Aga Khan Foundation, which was approved by the Board of Foundation. And we collaborated with a number of agencies, ISAF, the Indo-Canadian Financing Facility, IFAD, you know, like at that point of time in 99, there was not even a single graduate girl. And my first observation of a pregnant mother actually dying in the village and seeing the death myself almost like in a way and helplessly seeing that uh, was in the state of Rajasthan in a deep block two hours away from Delhi. That made me recommit myself to maternal newborn health, my passion otherwise, which was there. And on that day, when I returned back to Delhi, I said, I need to get out of foundation now and need to look for other opportunities. And that's around the time when I said, I felt that I had uh, the opening up of the WHO, uh, the then WHO representative and um, the deputy actually uh, tabbed. And then it was possible for me to enter in the WHO India office. And I could say very proudly 
that it was after this learning journey when I landed up in WHO until today. It's 20 years of journey in WHO as well. But I could say how satisfied today I sit when I see the progress in India. In 2001 onwards, been involved in the introduction of skill birth attendance in India, been responsible for the first ever pilot of the safe abortion, the manual vacuum aspiration uh, technique in India, was involved in the first medical termination of pregnancy amendment act after the 1971 that was in the 2003 involved in the introduction of medical abortion in the country the first ever emergency contraceptive pill uh, that got introduced following the consortium that we did with all india institute and proxy uh, was hugely hugely uh, you know challenging when we were talking about emergency obstetric care improvement and we developed the first foxy who government of india course of 16 weeks, uh, which was implemented by number of partners, number of state, and the 18 weeks training program for life saving anesthetic skills for emergency obstetric care. You know, like looking into also contributing to the maternity benefit scheme, which is called the Janani Suraksha Yojana, being part of the task force. And you can say, I have been partner or a culprit in terms of the crime that has been there with regard to the National Rural Health Mission, was involved in the launching of. National Rural Health Mission, and I still remember vividly um, the, the launch with the, the then Prime Minister uh, Manmohan Singh and the you know like Nobel laureate and economist um, uh, Professor Amrita Sen, uh, and you know like it was just like a like a dream come true. Collaborated and partnered with our professional association first time. WHO generously collaborated with IAPSM, IPHA, Foxy, as well as with the PSI, uh, IAP. You know like look into collaboration with railways and ESI, started talking about medical education, worked on traditional medicine, you know, like the Diab and the Ayush products, which are out from the Ministry of uh, Ayush now, uh, done a lot of extensive work on malaria and artemisin kind of a theory, uh, artemisin replacement and all of those things with the Department of Ayush, extensively worked with the nursing fraternity and the nursing professionals. In fact, a couple of my colleagues who are here they have really immensely contributed to the work that WHO was leading in nutrition on one side. I see some messages from Dr. Anchita, who had been one stalwarts, and of course, my fellow panelist, uh, Dr. Shireen, who has been uh, another stalwart, who have had the, I have had the honor of working with these bright, brilliant people uh, from Sevagram. Uh, you know, like the journey doesn't stop at one place. Within WHO also, it is also challenging and uh, you know, you need to keep challenging yourself. So from the journey of the country office and having done that, one really felt that you need to move onward, you need to move forward. And as it happens is from the national, you then start looking into beyond the boundaries, uh, which is within the country. And I started moving from one country to the other. I went on to uh, have a position in DPR Korea. Again, I haven't been uh, choosing the easy countries, or you could say that the countries, the easy ones have not been choosing me. Um, so it has been something like this that uh, I went to North Korea where I, I can say very satisfactorily a lot of changes that we were able to bring for the benefit of people. Ultimately, whatever that we do, it should make the change uh, in the lives of people. It is ultimately improvement in the quality of lives of people that matters the most. I was involved in mobilizing funding of around $60 million for a newborn and maternal health care program for North Korea, mobilized an $87 million program for the Global Fund, HIV, TB, malaria. We could have first establishment of a WHO collaborating center for traditional medicine, Korea medicine, in DR Korea during those days. Have the one of the most successful establishment of telemedicine network in 240 counties, fully functional in DPR Korea, which is still date functional, from 2007 to 11, when I was there, we established this uh, telemedicine network and, to, and you know, like did the twinning, twinning with the SGPGI Lucknow, which has the Asia's only institution of telemedicine. We did the twinning for newborn care with the Department of Neonatology in All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I was very grateful to Professor Garg, who agreed to come to, to DPR Korea for strengthening their household doctor program. The words unique program where there is a doctor for every 110 uh, for every 30 families. So it's a kind of an experience and a journey where you learn, you contribute. 
I then moved to regional office after that in 2011 uh, as regional advisor for maternal reproductive health. I had the chance to work with many of you during that tenure, but my passion at that time remained uh, one on quality of care. The second was on task shifting and task sharing, which we did a lot still with the Indian government at that point of time. And what uh, we heard and learned from Dr. Shastri from his pioneering work uh, and the regional work that we did, where his contributions has been immense, whatever little that I could do to get the regional comprehensive control of cervical cancer framework done, the entire training modules, the, the training aids, the Atlas and everything which is now available and would be launched also through the WHO Academy as a structured training program. And that's a product of the Southeast Asia regional office. Uh, from the region, you know, like my heart always lied in the country. So even if I was back in the regional office, uh, I was always yearning to go back to countries when my regional director decided to send me first, you know, like as the uh, WHO representative in acting capacity to Sri Lanka. Then I went for some time to Bangladesh and uh, then I became the WHO representative in Maldives. Uh, and you can imagine that as a WHO representative, uh, one has the, you know, like chance to work at a policy with the minister, with the head of state. And that's what I am currently doing as well in Timor Leste as the, uh, the WHO representative. Uh, but just to share with you that what had excited, what had made me go uh, every time, you know, with a change and uh, the change is the most constant thing in life. That's what we always say this thing. And, uh, you know, like it is very, very important to feel and to understand that all appears to change when we change. And that's something which uh, Henry uh, Amel said. I think it is very important for us to remember this. I have been very fortunate that as I took over the WHO representative position in Maldives, uh, following the polio uh, elimination and eradication in the Southeast Asia region, Maldives gave me an opportunity to kick start the war for elimination of other diseases. In 2015, I was one uh, with the regional director that we could certify Maldives for elimination of malaria. In 2016, uh, we eliminated lymphatic polarises in 17 measles. In 2018, we were certified for rubella control. In 2019, for elimination of mother to child transmission of HIV and syphilis. And in 2020, uh, despite the COVID challenge, we actually were uh, able to get the certification for rubella elimination something which is very satisfying both as a public and professional level, but you can imagine <laughs> elimination is not an easy task. It is something which involves a humongous amount of uh, work at the community level, at the policy level, at the program level, multi-sectorally. And one could guide, advise, motivate and encourage and take it forward. And you know, like now we are working in Timor Leste as well during the COVID times. It's a it's a country which is only 20 years, the second youngest country uh, in the world. 20, 2002, it got independence and the systems are suboptimal, weak, uh, the capacities are low. We are grappling with the COVID-19 situation, but at the same time, we are working on to a several of such initiatives, including the introduction of HPV vaccine, but also on the other side, the cervical cancer screening on the lines that was talked and stated about earlier. And just to reflect that, there are a number of such opportunities that one has been able to get because one continues to learn. And this journey that I am sharing with you, I mean, like, is in relation to whatever that I am talking about. Uh, you know, I owe it to, of course, my teachers, my mentors, my peers, uh, my younger colleagues like yourself, who have actually been the ones, those who have been stimulating me uh, to be different stimulating me to strive for excellence. And that's mm -hmm. something in any field you are, please do strive for excellence. I mean, unless and until that yearning is there, it wouldn't be, you know, like fire, that the fire in the valley needs to be there. Uh, we today needs to be embracing newer technologies for sure. There is no doubt about it, that we need to really talk about different things. I mean, today we are not only talking about our intellectual abilities, we're talking about on one side, emotional intelligence, on the other side, artificial intelligence. We are looking into talking, you know, like, and I know that the conference has probably reflected on to artificial intelligence and PSM, the use of big data. And I know some of the panelists would be talking about this, but please embrace them. 
please explore them. Don't be afraid. Don't go on the same rut like what we talk about. And I can tell you that if you have the passion of changing lives and saving lives, but also changing lives and saving lives along with changing livelihoods, you know, you, would, you cannot imagine how satisfactory it would be. Focus on your fellow peers, young people, but also the younger generation, the next generation. Have that responsibility, give commitment, because, you know, all along that we talk about, all these things, will come to play a role and all these tenets, the, the kind of uh, competencies of uh, mentorship that we are talking about today as if we are mentoring you, you would be doing the same to others. The networking, the relationship building, uh, looking into accepting feedback and criticism and critiquing and looking into, you know, like know your work, know what you are doing. And finally, as the last point that I could say, you know, like I have felt it as a motto. That's my motto. When I do my team retreats, I have a team of around 100 plus people in Timor Leste now here. And we have a two, two word motto. And the two word motto is be better. And that is for be better in everything you do, whether it is teaching, whether it is research, whether it is, you know, like the kind of leadership work I am doing, or if it is your personal life, your personal relation in every field, in every walk of life, you know, like whether you are doing uh, one discipline or multidisciplinary work, one sector or multi-sectoral work, please look into it, think about it, reflect onto it. Can't we commit to be better in every field? I'll stop at that and thank you so very much for this wonderful opportunity. I do hope uh, to have uh, stimulated or inspired a few people uh, as much as I felt inspired when I was asked to be part of this wonderful elite panel as well. So thank you so very much and over to you. Thank you, Dr. Mathur, for your uh, very motivating uh, speech. Uh, I am sure that uh, our colleagues uh, would have got the message that there are many other avenues beyond the walls of academic institutions. So one can go into program, work at the grassroots level, rise to serve at the policy level in different organizations. And that is what you have done. And rather than thinking about the usual uh, occupation or usual choice of being a teacher in a medical institution that sometimes gives more uh, kind of security, but uh, at times taking a plunge into something which you like and doing it is equally satisfying. So thank you very much. And uh, please stay back. There will be some questions sure. uh, uh, by the participants at the end of uh, when all the panelists have spoken. So over to Abhishek. Can you invite uh, the next panelist? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arvind, sir. And like uh, Arvind, sir, was mentioning uh, about in artificial intelligence, big data analysis. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Heman Kulkarni, sir, who has not only explored Embrace, but he has excelled in this field of uh, big data analysis. You name the statistical technique, and he has mastered it. If you go through his uh, research work, the kind of papers that he has published, uh, it's unparalleled. Uh, it was very kind of him to conduct a workshop on artificial intelligence in Indian public health scenario two days back for the delegates of our uh, conclave. Uh, sir is an alumni of uh, Government Medical College Nagpur uh, and uh, currently he's working uh, as a chief executive officer at the MNH Foundation. Rather, he's one of the founder members, uh, which is based in San Antonio, uh, Texas. Uh, over to you, Heman, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Abhishek, and thank you uh, to all the organizers and, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Garg, Subodh, uh, Abhay, and Zaheer, and Abhishek uh, for for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this uh, beautiful uh, conclave that you have uh, organized. Uh, you know what? Uh, after listening to Dr. Shastri and Dr. Mathur. I'm not sure what is there, what is left to say. I mean, they've covered like 
every everything and those those speeches have been so motivating for me myself that uh, you will agree that it's really not only humbling but kind of embarrassing to be a part of this panel because they are like stalwarts and I'm basically nobody um, but uh, but still uh, just to honor the request that the organizers made I'll I'll try to share uh, the the story of uh, uh, you know, my uh, academic uh, journey. Uh, but I would like to remind you that Shakespeare said that uh, there are three kinds of great people. Those who are born great, like Dr. Shastri, those who are who achieve greatness, like Dr. Mathur, and then those on whom greatness is trust, like me. So I, I'm, no, I'm nowhere uh, in, in comparison to these people, these, you know, stalwarts uh, and other stalwarts in this uh, panel. Uh, and I, I do look forward to also hearing from Dr. Mazwani and uh, Dr. Uh, Sharin. But uh, I think life is a is a continuous process, and that this continuous process, uh, you know, proffers us yields some defining moments. And these defining moments, if we are able to understand that this is really, uh, you know, the key moment or the or the key message that I'm getting, that's when. That's so Think things happen and uh, our course of uh, journey changes for the better or for the worse. Uh, for me, one of the defining moments, and you know, it's, it's really uh, uh, important to know the kind of impression that our teachers uh, leave on us. Uh, we had a very, uh, very respected and a highly talented teacher uh, of surgery, uh, Dr. N.K. Deshmukh in uh, GMC. Where, uh, where in during my second MBBS, we were doing, uh, you know, the surgery posting. I was, uh, I had had the pleasure of presenting a case to him. I remember that case. It was a 13 year old girl, uh, uh, and the case was given to me as a case of portal hypertension, and I started presenting it to him. Now it also happened that that patient I had. Uh, I mean, you could see that the chin of that patient was a little, you know, there was a dimple that that was not as grown as uh one would expect and uh, you know being in the second year when you're given a case of um, something you just present it as that case you don't look you don't have the vision to uh, think holistically so when i started presenting the case uh, and i described the symptoms dr deshmukh uh, interrupted and said uh tell me what what that uh, uh, observation about her face and i said um I think her chin is small and said, what's the name for that? What's the technical uh, name for that condition? And while I was struggling to find the name, somebody prompted micrognathia and he said, yes, that's what it is. And then he said one sentence that has actually stayed with me for the rest of my life. Um, and that he said that you know, as a surgeon, I want to know about the patient, not about just one disease that the patient has and a bit of a knowledge. He said, a bit of a knowledge is never a waste. And I think that message has left with, has, has you know, stuck with me for a long time. And in anything that I do or have done thereafter, I think I've tried to make sure that we we justify this, this concept that a bit of a knowledge is never a waste. So when uh, I had a choice between uh, uh, you know, pediatrics doing uh, taking a career in pediatrics versus doing uh, preventive social medicine. I chose preventive social medicine because I, I knew in the heart of my heart that, I mean, of course, not that you cannot do research in any other field. You can do research everywhere. But uh, but to 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 foster my interest in uh, in statistics and uh, and computing, uh, I, which was be very nascent at that time in India. Uh, I thought that this this is what I need to take up, and um, it was uh, like uh, Dr. Shastri said, it was also a conscious uh, decision. And you know, once having gotten into this uh, uh, stream of science, some of my friends, some of my teachers, they they also asked me, "Are you crazy? You're going to PSM?" And and I would I would tell them that what, just as beautiful knowledge is never a waste, and when I started thinking, I had some discussions with a very good friends of mine, very stimulating discussions, and they used to, you know, we used to say, well, 
what can be philosophically more fulfilling than stopping a thing or an event or from happening rather than you know trying to take corrective action once it has happened so from a philosophical standpoint i definitely feel that there is nothing no clinical medicine parallels uh, the concept uh, as much as uh, preventive social medicine does or community medicine does also practically uh, you know if if we think about clinical medicine uh, it is taking one patient at a time treating the patient and and helping out on the other we like dr mathur said we are talking about a large number of patients and dr shastri also said that. we're talking about a large number of people and so for us from the standpoint of uh, of being impactful practically i think that uh, community medicine uh, you know gives you that opportunity the third thing that community medicine did to me was uh, was it actually gave me the confidence that maybe maybe i can contribute to uh, to the society you know directly or indirectly somehow and it's this uh, uh, this desire this itch to do uh, to do something uh, with which I think I joined uh, preventive social medicine. I uh, did my uh, post graduation also, and from that point on, I think that uh, the approach that I have had to my life um, it has generally been that of a leaf floating in air. It, it is ready to go anywhere where the wind takes it. Dr. Mathur said that we should be open-minded. Uh, we should. You should not be, you know, uh, tunnel vision of, uh, you should not have the tunnel vision of just focusing on very uh, narrow goals. And one of the ways uh, I think that has helped me, and I, I do uh, urge all my uh, young friends also to, to, take, uh, to think about this, is that the more uh, lateral you think, the more comprehensive you think, the better it uh, makes you as a person. Uh, I, to, to, again, I am no in no way uh, and in no position to give anyone any advice as such because I don't think uh, I'm on that pedestal as the rest of the uh, elite panel is. But uh, I, I do uh, think that if we open ourselves okay. to the uh, to the events, the challenges, the questions, the difficulties that life poses us. That's when we grow. Now, I do want to tell you though, that it's, you know, life will not be. There's no person on this earth who has an easy life. No one. We all have our struggles. We all have our difficulties. And if our own struggles are so personal and so specific that it cannot be generalized and should not be generalized. We learn from our own experiences. We have learned. Uh, we have lived our own life. Nobody else knows anything about it. However, we can learn from uh, you know others' examples, and uh, to to that extent, I think that uh, uh, we, we uh, what I'm sharing is just an example of you know the 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 journey that I have uh, uh, had to undertake. Uh, we uh, I after doing my uh, post graduation. Uh, in the uh, government medical college, uh, started a, a clinical epidemiology unit, as they used to call it, and uh, this was actually funded by uh, the uh, Rockefeller Foundation here. And I had an opportunity to be trained as a health social scientist in uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, and after that one year uh, uh, small stint at the uh, at UNC Chapel Hill, I went back to India. And I think uh, I had very, you know, very high hopes that I would be doing this. And you know, in youth, that's what you do. Uh, I want to do this. I want to change the world, and I want to do so and so forth, which is great. That passion is, of course, important. But that passion somehow, sometimes, tends to neglect the realities of life. And the reality was that it's it's never easy. Now, what Dr. Shastri, Dr. Mathur have just shared with us. Is their success story, but ask them about their challenges that they faced. 
their success have not, have not just been given to them. They've learned it. And um, when I tried to implement some of the things I wanted to do, it wasn't easy. Nobody, you know, all like uh, uh, Roberts and Schumacher, Everett Rogers and Schumacher, they say that uh, every idea that you, a new idea that you implant, it starts with rejection. And then you need to have the perseverance to go ahead and, you know, take that idea to, to its completion. As long as you believe that the idea was is uh, uh, is radical and is important and is helpful, so um, I had some difficulties, uh, and so for to handle that, I didn't. I don't think I accepted that uh, that nothing can be done, but I thought that one of the ways that can be addressed is to have a non-governmental organization. I set up one. Uh, I uh, set up one organization in my mother's name. It's called Lata Medical Research Foundation. I started that foundation in Nagpur uh, in the year 1999. And over the last 20, over 20 years, that organization has really done, you know, phenomenally well. We have uh, done a lot of research in several areas, including maternal child health, you know, pediatrics, uh, non-communicable diseases. We just started in non-communicable diseases, diabetes, and uh, no obesity uh, off late. So, okay, long story short, we have a lot uh, achieved a lot just by taking that different route of uh, the, the foundation. At that time, I was also working as a lecturer in uh, the prevention social medicine department, and uh, uh, it so happens that uh, I've been gifted with uh, with wonderful students very, very appreciative colleagues. And uh, it's, it's because of that, that I didn't know, you know, I, I didn't uh, know that I have uh, uh, given some good guidance or some uh, right directions to some of my students. But one of my students was here uh, in the US. Uh, he had moved to, to, to the US. And it turns out he mentioned my name to some of his uh, superiors and his supervisor called me and they talked and they offered me a position. Uh, and so I came here in 2002. Uh, and in 2002, I came here as, uh, as a researcher in the field of HIV. I came here in 2004, and I think in 2005, December, we were able to publish a paper in science with me as the first co-author uh, of that paper. And uh, it was about genetics. We, we've done a lot of work in the host genetics of HIV, uh, and then, autoimmune diseases. So we we uh, spread all our uh, tentacles in all, all possible directions, but primarily focused on uh, HIV. Now, uh, having saturated my mind uh, with, with that field for some time, I thought that uh, it might be better if I move on, like Dr. Mathur said, you know, there's nothing wrong in moving on. Um, so here in San Antonio, there is a, a, a very well-renowned organization called Texas Biomed uh, Research Institute. So I joined that, and I uh, was working with uh, a mentor who will remain one of my most favorite persons on earth uh, ever, and that his name is Dr. John Blangero, uh, and he is uh, one of the father figures in the field of uh, population genetics and uh, statistical genetics. Uh, so, uh, we got to work a lot on, you know, diabetes related and uh, cardiovascular diseases, obesity, uh, all these, uh, you know, cholesterol uh, situation of this. And, and uh, for us, we having situ been situated in San Antonio, uh, Mexican American population has been our focus. So, I worked uh, uh, for a long time with, uh, with them. And uh, then uh, in 2014, we were blessed with uh, a beautiful uh, uh, daughter. Uh, and, you know, my life's journey will never ever be complete without mentioning uh, Manju, who is also, by the way, an alumni of uh, Government Medical College, uh, Nagpur. She's also an MD uh, community medicine. And she and I have uh, been, it's, I know God has been kind. Uh, since we uh, came to the United States, she and I have had the same jobs. We were put in the same lab. We worked both in uh, at the University of Texas Health Science Center. Then we both worked in the Texas Biomed, and then we both moved on as faculty members <coughs> to uh, 
the Rio Grande Valley University of Texas in Brownsville and uh, uh, Harlingen. We worked there for uh, some time, but in 2014 we were blessed with this uh, beautiful daughter. So uh, for us, because having a home in San Antonio and that four-hour drive and all those uh, difficulties of you know personal life, we decided that it may not be possible for us uh, to continue that position. So we came back and started a research consultancy of our own. Now, all, all the while, I'm still heading the uh, Latham Medical Research Foundation uh, as president when I, uh, which I started way back. Uh, but last five or six years, uh, we have been uh, working with uh, the, this MNH uh, research consultancy that we started, me and my wife. And we, uh, you know, now the focus, since the world has actually woken up to uh, artificial intelligence, that's not the only thing we do, but that's the primary focus uh, uh, that we have been uh, uh, trying to uh, concentrate upon. And we published some uh, very interesting uh, papers uh, in, in that field. And uh, some of those are getting an attention now because uh, one of the, that has also to do with this COVID-19 uh, thing. And um, uh, we're making, uh, you know, national level recommendations. Uh, we published in JAC, which is the General of American College of Cardiology. Uh, and you know, all such uh, high uh, impact, highly revered journals, uh, very esteemed journals. Um, and having published a, close to 150 papers now, I, uh, I, I believe that research uh, is one track that, uh, that young uh, you know, people getting into this discipline can definitely and should definitely uh, think about. Um, and I, I, like I said, I was, uh, I was a teacher. I was uh, a, 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 a researcher. I was working in the field of genetics. But having all those hats, I think there's one hat that I've consistently worn, and that of being a student. I, I think that we uh, con we will continue to be living as uh, as students till the last day of our life. The moment, the day we uh, stop learning, we we don't uh, you know deserve to uh, live. We we need we need to be really uh, focused on uh, on being a student, keeping our eyes and ears open, uh, keeping our minds open, and making sure that we uh, take this uh, life, the gift as it is, uh, to its fruitful uh, logical uh, conclusion. When at the end of the uh, life, like Robert Frost says uh, in his, his poem two roads diverged in the, in the yellow woods. And I can say that I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hemant, for uh, reminding all of us this uh, notion of, you know, lifelong learning, as your example shows, starting with the teaching in a academic institution, taking up research, and that too in a unconventional field of genetics, and then computing, and now artificial intelligence. What a journey uh, you have traveled so far, and we are sure that you will continue this journey to newer fields and achieve newer heights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Abhishek, can we have the next panelist? We yes. will have some questions maybe from the audience towards the end. Uh, thank yes, you, Dr. Sure. Heyman, thank one you. once more. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, we have our next uh, panelist, and it's a, a pleasure to uh, uh, introduce uh, Kishore Madhwani, sir. Uh, we have always, uh, I mean, he is a very uh, cheerful personality. Uh, I've had uh, opportunities to meet him. And he is one of the few people who has a PhD in office ergonomics. Uh, sir is an alumni. Uh, he has done his undergraduation from uh, Sevagram, so he has that connect with uh, MJMS. And then he uh, did his uh, post graduation from uh, Mumbai. Uh, uh, like we can equate preventive oncology with uh, Shastri sir's name for all practical purposes within India, or for that matter, outside India, we can equate the name of occupational health with uh, Madhwani, sir. Uh, 
he is operating from the center of excellence and research in occupational medicine and primary health care services that's his own uh, center of excellence that he has established in south mumbai and uh, he was instrumental uh, in making the office ergonomics uh, getting implemented in uh, 11 countries uh, that's what he has uh, personally shared so we look forward to listen to you sir uh, uh, for us you are a true champion uh, over to you sir Madhwani, sir. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Sir. Okay, actually, good evening to all of you. Uh, Abhishek, you'll have to give me the screen for sharing. Yes, sir. Uh, that's it, Abhishek. Yes, Use the screen. Uh, uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to be here with all of you. I am uh, privileged to be here with Dr. Shastri, Dr. Mathur, Dr. Hemant, and other faculty, Dr. Sharon. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about my journey. I am a student of Dr. Shastri when I joined in the ET batch. Dr. Shastri was the doctor who was responsible for me in the college for the village that I had adopted. So he was our doctor, our guru. So he's been my guru since then. So Guru Anna, salute to you and what you've achieved over the years. I'm totally awed and inspired. And uh, that is what a standing ovation. Wow, that's really great to know. But I'm grateful that we had this panel discussion. So we are able to meet. We are able to know what each one of us is doing. Otherwise, we are so busy. So this has been a learning, not only for the students, but for all of us. So I'd like to share my screen. Abhishek, is the screen? No, sir, not yet. Uh, sir, uh, if you mail it to us, we can share it from here. If it's that, if that's convenient to you. I shall share it with you. Yes, sir, we will share it from here. Let me see. Yes, sir. Now we are able to see. Okay. Sorry for this. Uh, 
No, sir, absolutely not. Okay, so we go ahead. So I'm sorry for this and uh, thank you, Dr. Shastri ji for inspiring all of us and Dr. Mathur and Dr. Himan and Dr. Sharon, we are going to listen. Their achievements are really inspiring to me also. And um, I would like to thank Abhishek, Professor Garg, Rakesh Kumar ji, Subhud Gupta Zari. Please excuse me if I missed out some name for inviting me here. Yeah, and I would like to mention and reiterate what Dr. Shastri mentioned that today's pandemic has given us an amazing opportunity to all PSM, community medicine, and occupational health faculty to project themselves, to develop themselves, and also to launch themselves. So this platform today can be developed and exploited to our best. Now, before I proceed further, my presentation, as you can see, I, will, I made it especially for us postgraduate students and how we have a career path for us in community medicine after we graduate. It's a little bit for students, but I think it may help them. When you have a six month residency in community medicine, that is the time you must explore what will be your career options in the future. And when you do your post graduation of two years in the department, you can finalize and select your career option. Well, that was the pattern that we had. If it's different, if you have a three year direct training, you can even develop yourself even further. You can do additional courses and diplomas and then get your postgraduate degree in MD. So once you're graduated, when I graduated, I got a job offer to join MGIMS Seva Gram. So I joined as a lecturer. So one option is you could join a parent institute and take up a career, just like Professor Abhishek is there. That is one option. But then when I did this course, I wanted to go to Harvard to do the Takemi program in occupational health. Applied for it, came in the last 12, but then disqualified. Then I said, okay, now let me go back to Mumbai. And the family was calling, but I decided, when I took up this course, that if I start a career, I will continue teaching. I will do private practice morning and evening. And in the daytime, I will provide occupational health consultancy to corporates. That's why I took my thesis on bisphenosis. There are a lot of ginning mills around Varda. So I took up a study in ginning mills especially doing the lung function tests among the seasonal workers there. And from there, started my journey into specialization. I would say super specialization of occupational health. Now preventive medicine, community medicine is our speciality. But then if you develop a niche area, I want to develop in it, we could call it as a super specialization. So occupational health and then go into niche area of that would be better because nobody has approached that path. And then there, you will definitely be able to prove yourself also, provided you have a passion for it. So one is you continue in the college. Second, you can acquire additional training and become more qualified, take up hospital administration, take up a career in occupational health, do an MD or a PhD or an affiliate fellow in industrial health. This is a three month course. And then you can become a, a civil surgeon, a certifying surgeon, 
and join factories and organizations like Reliance, Kellogg, Siemens, HUL, etc. So you can take up a career in occupational health. When I was a student, I was not knowing about this aspect that I can take up a career in occupational health. And it was only through when I ventured, started my private practice, daytime I did corporate occupational health consultancy, then I realized there is a demand for occupational health physicians. Now, what was my age there? I'm an occupational physician. I'm a family physician. My age over my competitors was my clinical skills. The clinical skills are very important. The chairman of the company or even the driver, he needs a doctor first. Rest of the things come later. So occupational health is an icing over your cake. But your cake is community medicine, your clinical skills. And that's what your alma mater, Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, now known as Sushila Nair Institute of Public Health, is famous for. You know, today you're having these esteemed faculty who have reached great heights. It's because of the training and the foundation that are laid in education. The next thing that you can do is join as a medical advisor of pharmaceutical companies doing clinical research trials and becoming a medical advisor there. Also, you can pursue a career in ICMR, WHO, biotechnology, genetics, as uh, today's uh, faculties have embarked upon and they made their mark. They are doing very well. And uh, that's another area that one should explore. And I chose to do private practice because I love my practice and freelance occupational consultancy because I wanted my independence to various organizations. So that's been the little bit career path which may help you to explore further. I'll tell you about my path. So I do general practice morning, evening. I was doing till 2020 when the pandemic started, after which I'm doing online consultation. But then online consultation today, I'm providing consultancy to my patients in UAE, USA, UK, because they have faith in me. We send medicines from here by Korea if they can wait. But they can consult you at that time. Some of them carry medicines from India. Of course, our prescription not be valid. But when we can talk on phone and we can advise them, why not? So it has been legalized in India. And then we are maintaining patient records on the cloud. And we are supposed to do. And this may be the future for the next one or two years. So those of you who are going into private practice should consider this is a good option. It is time saving. You can see more patients. You can make more money. And you can add more value because you can send videos and uh, you know how to use an inhaler. Everything you can do online. You can send medicines online. So this is another area. General practice for you is excellent. Then occupational consultancy to companies. So factories, corporate offices, banks, shop establishment, malls, everywhere you need doctors. And what happened during the pandemic, earlier I was doing consultancy as a freelancer, so maybe three or four companies. Today I've got eight companies. In the pandemic, the demand increased because everybody wanted online. So we are trying to manage advice patients right from our home, whether it's Jammu and Kashmir or it is Chennai. And believe me, the patients are so happy that they are getting such wonderful service. And it is possible to examine even an online consultation by WhatsApp video consultations. I thought it never be possible, but let me tell you, 
a new era has been explored and be further developed when 5G comes in. The 5G will take time, but yes, definitely it will be much better. And then we also need to make sure that we optimize our care. I started taking up companies which could help me to develop my career and which really care for their employees. So I am today choosing and select good companies. What are the advantages when you do a private practice and you also do occupational consultancy? One of the teaching skills that you acquired during your college days is well executed here. You are so satisfied with the job that you're doing. You use this opportunity to further educate and develop yourself. And you develop your network when enhancing your career. You can take up more courses. If you take up more courses, your company will pay you more if you are giving more value to them with the courses you undertake. So I was asked to undertake a course on ergonomics and I went to Harvard to do it. And again, I came and whatever I learned from there, I implemented it in the companies that I'm working. So that way you can develop yourself even further. Also, you can become life member of professional bodies, attend the conferences, take up executive positions. This will help the organizations that you're working for if you want their product endorsements or you want to market their products, you're not doing anything wrong. Okay, you're promoting a product. Of course, you may come in the eye, but the fact is you join the organization to develop yourself. The session is sponsored by the company and then everybody from other companies can also speak. So you're not going to talk for your company, but everybody can participate. Very important to conduct research and occupational health Many of the doctors in general practice, they're so occupied, they don't conduct research. Today, I have around 23 publications in peer reviewed index journals to build my image and to gain visibility. The only drawback for me is I'm not very popular on social media. And that is what in 2021 I will be doing. I'll try to achieve social media mastery not to say high and by, but to project myself and further develop my career. So my story, my potential was untapped by my senior who asked me to find out why the cases of backache are increasing in the organization that I was working for. So I told him, I'm already a burden with patients. So what are you asking me to do? No, no, you have to do, get me a solution. But when I undertook this research project. So I took expertise from Central Institute, Central Labor Institute, because they have uh, expertise in this subject. I learned from them. And when we came out with the results for the organization, I realized, wow, this is an ocean. People don't do anything. And I asked the organization, which, you know, you, uh, the Central Labor Institute, please tell me how we can improvise the situation of office ergonomics in uh, my company. They said, you know, what was the answer? Sorry, that is not our job. That is your job. Our job is to find out whether the problem is there. How much is the problem? To correct it is your problem. Oh God. So from there, I realized that I have to educate people, not only my company, but everywhere. Today in the pandemic, children are using computers. Everyone is working from home. Everybody needs training and office ergonomics. So I enrolled myself for a PhD and believe it or not, it was like Shah Rukh Khan from Mehuna. I reached Gujarat University. They said, we will exempt you, but when the date of examination closes, up, no, you have to sit in the exam. Oh God, again, I started studying. 
I had to appear for the exam. I was uh, 52 years when I gave this exam. Today, I'm 60 years. 52, I gave the exam and I came fourth in it. <laughs> and then there was an interview and I got my PhD. In the PhD, they said, why should we give you your a student seat is very important. Justify. I said, no, I want to do it because I want to help the people. I want to help humanity. And I want to teach them the right postures which people are not aware. So this PhD will be very important to establish me and people will then listen to me. I want to research. I want to do books. I want to train people. I want to provide furniture infrastructure, what people can use, what ergonomic skills they can use, how can they adjust their workstations ergonomically to their body dimensions to minimize problems. So they said, okay. So I started in 52, completed in 19, sorry, at the age of 52, I started. I finished at the age of 58, 2012 to 2018. Six years it took me to finish it. And uh, after that, I decided that now I must train more and more people in office ergonomics. And I did this research in 13 countries of the world, including Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, uh, UK, USA, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, the Southeast Asian countries, Africa, in Durban and Nairobi, and believe me, all over the world, including USA, the knowledge to work safely on computers, laptops, is very, very, very minimal. An area that needs to be explored, an area that needs to be developed. So I have now taken up as a mission, and it is my passion to make sure that more and more people get trained in this to bring about some impact to the world. Then, what did I do? As a life member for executive positions I had in the Indian National Occupational Health, started doing research. I was a general secretary for the Indian General Occupational and Environmental Medicine for 2009 to 2018. And I've joined SEOH as the vice president, that's the Society of Education, uh, Society of Environment Occupational Health, and the Society for Advancement of Occupational Environmental Health. Today, I'm in these associations, and here we want more and more wellness, environment health, safety, and occupational health professionals to join these associations so that we can propagate the message of wellness amongst India and the world. And of course, you must become life member in IASM, IPHA, these are parent bodies, do research, network with people, see if you can join the associations, organizations, do some collaborative research to further your development. I joined another organization called as the Association of Family Physicians of India, AFPI. Believe me, excellent association of family doctors. Doctors who've done DNB in family medicine from Christian Medical College, Velour, Pune, and other colleges which promote family medicine, they are members of the association. There are a thousand, and believe me, they practice evidence-based medicine. We have our own uh, CMEs and even doctors from abroad are members for the association. In fact, we are having on 27 a uh, webinar from USA. The doctor is teaching us on lifestyle medicine. Well, this is different than IMA, FFPAI, GPA. I would highly recommend that those who are interested must join AFPI. And I also join the World Organization of Family Doctors in executive positions. I look after Wonka, the South Asia region for occupational health and emergency medicine. And I am now 
taking up key positions here to promote occupational health and family medicine in India. I have trained many doctors in Wonka, in Korea, Philippines, and in India, Sri Lanka. And the aim is to train more and more doctors also. And I have been invited by the International Commission of Occupational Health to join their global expert panel for diagnosing musculoskeletal disorders. This was offered to me in 2019. So the PhD has helped me to achieve great heights and become a global figure helping out people in, and even the scientific committee in their ambitions and goals. So what have been the accomplishments? Been doing clinically well, as well as doing academic research in occupational health and family medicine both. Currently published a good amount of papers, and I'm the editor for occupational section for the Journal of Family Medicine Primary Health Care that was launched in 2016. Going to become an editor for the Journal for Society of Environmental Occupational Health, which will be launched this year. I will request some of you to come in on as advisors and join us and the editorial team. Uh, that we will start soon. I'm writing blogs for the Daily Eye on the Corona pandemic and earlier for newspaper callers than Hindustan Times, DNA. And I'm writing my book on office ergonomics. I'll be writing more and more books to help the masses. I'll be doing more and more webinars, free webinars to train the people. And I'm planning to go out now commercially to start my startup. I have my clinic at Nepensi Road, which I'm renovating and making it a center of excellence in occupational medicine. It will also be displaying ergonomic furniture, ergonomic tables, and it will become a training center for students, occupational health, faculties, and all because I have space to make it into a training hall, which I have already done. So I'm going to make it as a center of excellence in occupational medicine, wellness, and primary health care services for private practice, trainings, occupational consultancy, and a specialty institute for office ergonomics. As my mission and vision, I will share with you. My mission is to empower 10 million people. That's my first goal. With skills for early detection and control of communicable diseases. This is very important with the work which Dr. Mathur, Dr. Shastri, Dr. Abhay are doing, and also prevention of musculoskeletal disorders related to computer use and smartphones. Musculoskeletal disorders is the second biggest occupational health problem all over the globe. And we in India have a younger population. Younger population is using these devices and we are having more and more of the issues. We need to address it. And my vision is, to acquire holistic wellness for all and ergonomic use of computer devices and smartphones, it becomes a way of life for the human race. So this is my mission and vision on which I'll be starting my startup maybe in six months time in 2021 and we'll look forward to your support and cooperation. As I'm official representative of AFPI, to the Wonka World Council. I request that a college, we start family medicine because the infrastructure is there for which I can come with the AFPI to Sevagram. And if any of our other esteemed alumni can come at that time, we can have a get together to come and inspire postgraduate students to work with and have a passion to go ahead in life, keep on learning and developing. See, the only change in life but there's nothing constant. Okay. We have to keep on changing and change is only constant. So learning from today's panel discussion. Wow. What a great alumni we have. I was not knowing. So thank you for inviting me. My alma mater, I really thank you for reestablishing connections with my fellow colleagues. We all must use the assistant network, especially you students as opportunities. Dr. Shastri has already mentioned there's a fellowship opportunity. Please go for it. Further develop a college department 
as we can have more super specialization and niche areas for research and development. I strongly recommend that we start MD in family medicine as the prime minister wants it and AIMS also has started it already. We have Dr. Vikas Bhatia, he's our alumni. He's a head of AIMS at Hyderabad. Dr. Sunil Agar, who has been my teacher who was at Moran Azhar Medical College, they could be involved and we should go ahead. So thank you very much for giving me a chance. I hope we'll have more opportunities to rekindle and meet with each other. These are my contacts and thank you very much for a patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Kishore. What a journey from community medicine, general practice, occupational health, and PhD at the age of 58. And now working internationally for ergonomics and advocacy for family medicine. Thank you very much indeed for taking a path which is less traveled. Thank you very much once again, uh, Abhishek, uh, if you can invite the last speaker. Uh, so since uh, 2009, when I have joined Sevagram, the one name that I have been hearing almost uh, every other day is of Sherin, sir. Sir, we consider you as our own. And uh, for the PGs at Sevagram, uh, you are a gold standard. Uh, so whenever uh, we have to inform anybody uh, from the department that what they should aspire for, uh, always Sherin sir's name uh, comes up first. So it's a pure pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sherin Varke sir to you. Uh, he's currently working as senior health specialist with health nutrition and population uh, global practice of the World Bank based in Washington DC. He's currently working on scaling up of COVID vaccination uh, uh, across the globe. Uh, understanding the impact of COVID-19 on health systems and use of technology from impro for improving healthcare delivery. Uh, uh, he has earlier uh, worked with UNICEF uh, in very difficult uh, areas like Timor-Leste, Eth Ethiopia, uh, Yemen, Afghanistan, uh, Uganda, uh, Iraq, uh, even DPR Korea for that matter. And he has led large scale and emergency development programs at national and international levels in, a variety, in many low and middle income uh, countries and settings. Uh, so over to you, Sharin, sir, and it's a pleasure and privilege to get connected to you and to be able to hear from you. And uh, almost, uh, almost the entire department is here to listen to you, sir. Thank you so much, Abhishek. Uh, can you confirm if you can see and hear me? We can see you as well as hear you, sir, yes. Thank you so much. So firstly, uh, let, let me begin by uh, conveying my humble greetings to all the uh, stalwarts who are here on the panel. And uh, in fact, I was so uh, amazed to and inspired by the stories they have shared, all of them. Of course, Dr. Arvind Mathur is like family and mentor, but uh, even hearing other experiences from the other panelists has been truly inspiring. Uh, a big thank you to uh, you, Abhishek, uh, Dr. Garg, Dr. Subodh Gupta, and everybody else who have put this together. I was so uh, jealous when I saw your agenda, when I went through the website, and uh, I mean, uh, I almost feel like coming back for another post-graduation. So <laughs> it's really a, such a forward-looking agenda, and huge congratulations for that. Uh, uh, and this opportunity of sharing was really important. My life over the last few months has been extremely busy supporting governments across the world, uh, you know, providing financing and advice on the COVID response, uh, including vaccination scale up, shaping markets as well. So, uh, a, a, you know, a break from that to introspect and explore the past and to really meet such bright minds is always, always welcome. So I'll share some of my experiences and I'm, I'm fully aware of the time. So I'll go quickly and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and later on, if possible, uh, I can share some ideas on what would be the future agenda in public health, uh, not five years from now, but probably 10, 15 years. And it's good to be prepared, especially for the young minds. 
but anyway, but I'll stick for now to uh, the journey ahead. And uh, really, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I come, I, you know, I'm a Malayali from Kerala, but I've spent my life in Pune. So I'm a Puneri. So, and, uh, you know, coming with from lower middle class family, uh, with parents who have struggled to put you through medical school, uh, you know, and they expect you to be a big, you know, a high earning clinician. And imagine the shock they expressed when, when, the, when I said I'm going to do public health. First of all, my dad never understood. He still doesn't understand. Uh, but uh, he was, uh, so, you know, because for at that time, landing in medical school was like landing on the moon. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was so important. And then uh, the only thing, the only way I told him is, don't worry, I'll be in the GOPD and I'll be looking at cases. I'll be looking at patients, so don't worry. So that's how I consoled him. Uh, but I was really passionate about uh, community medicine, public health right from day one. And uh, not to mention uh, Sevagram. Uh, I mean, Sevagram is, uh, I mean, many of you are so lucky. You don't know how incredibly fortunate you are to be in this land of learning in the land of Gandhi. I'm not saying this just like that. I sincerely mean it. And throughout my life, uh, the lessons I've imbibed from there have carried me. But most importantly, I think one of the life lessons I learned is to continuously be curious. And, uh, you know, before going for post-graduation, I did a small ICMR studentship uh, in microbiology and on uh, tuberculin testing for tuberculosis, of course. So, uh, and that really inspired me to look at public health seriously. And then, of course, the department with Dr. Garg, his astute leadership, and the opportunity to explore so many fields was what was really attracting me. Now, funny story, in my internship, I uh, was given the opportunity to work on a sickle cell project in the department. And I visited every corner of a couple of the districts around. And uh, the reason I wanted to do it is because that gave me access to a two wheeler, a scooter from the department. And I really enjoyed the free spirit of riding across Varda district in the most remote areas. But the learning I got from that was immense. And that's something I still carry with me. But importantly, colleagues, I was standing. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So I was standing on the shoulders of giants, and that has been really critical. Whether it is the uh, education, uh, the department itself, uh, the opportunity to meet people, uh, doyens in public health, I would I would be so eager to go to the airport to pick Dr. Arvind Mathur in one of his visits to Sevagram. Why? Because I would get his undivided attention in the one and a half hour drive from Nagpur to Varda. Uh, you know, we used to go in a white sumo at that time. And that used to be amazing because in that one and a half hour, and he humored me and he, he tolerated all my persistent questions. So really colleagues, public health today is the art of exploiting possibilities and use every opportunity you have to learn and also to contribute. Uh, you know, uh, when uh, in my post-graduation, I was very fortunate to work on verbal autopsies and, uh, and uh, uh, that was my uh, PG topic. Uh, also, I was given the opportunity to work on the, some of the projects uh, run by the department and that was immense, but everything which are a composite part of each of us as a personality is will help you in the long run and be unique. I still remember all those, uh, you know, my colleague Anchita is here, partner in crime in uh, organizing Sargam. I was the, I used to be the president of the association. I don't know how it is today. And uh, all the events we organized, I think, and you know, really inculcated the habit of projection and public speaking which are so important in, in all the careers we uh, undertake. And uh, that was uh, really thanks to the opportunities provided in Sevagram. Now, uh, colleagues, in life, there will be failures. There will be uncertainty. So please, uh, please don't, uh, don't let that pull you back. I have felt, I have felt times of disillusionment, 
but always reach out to somebody you can talk to, uh, peers, as well as the, some of the people here. Uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh Kumar, uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of uh, undergoing training programs so, uh, at his institute. So there are so many people who can advise you when you feel low and reach out and make that, uh, you know, make that effort. Uh, so, you know, of course, uh, you know, after post-graduation, I did a small stint with WHO, thanks to Dr. Arvind Mathur at that time. And then I joined UNICEF. In UNICEF, I was for, uh, for four years in Bihar, and I was in the, during the tough days in Bihar. And, uh, you know, in Bihar, there's a saying in those days, uh, Ek Bihari Sappe Bhari. Uh, you know, so it's not only the people, but also the education which I received in Bihar has been fundamental. So what I learned from Sevagram and Bihar have shaped my views of public health. And uh, I was, of course, leading newborn, uh, you know, uh, some of the immunization uh, and maternal health in Bihar. And from there, I moved to Timor-Leste. I went to uh, DPR Korea and I did TB and malaria in DPR Korea. Then I worked in Ethiopia, Uganda, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Yemen. So these, this has been my career path and I've been uh, grateful for the opportunities provided. But my message here is please have range in what you do as well. And there's a very good book by David Epstein. Uh, I would recommend all to read it. It was very inspiring for me called Range. And uh, so I think I was shaped by a lot of the things I learned and the work I did in immunization uh, and MNCH, TB malaria, I actually did a three year stint rolling out cash transfers because I, because I really felt strongly that uh, burden of health expenditure is the critical limiting factor. And then of course, move to leadership uh, because I wanted to take a more cross sectoral approach. And I was last working as the representative of UNICEF Yemen. Uh, but then after that, I had a time of introspection and in all these countries, in all these countries, I was always critical about the World Bank and its policies, about uh, the, the unfair leverage they had on policy shaping. And uh, finally, I decided enough of criticizing. Why don't you join them and uh, see how the world is wearing the issues? And that's how I recently moved to the World Bank. And I'm now supporting uh, one of the largest investments of the bank for COVID-19. It's about a $12 billion uh, investment supporting countries around the world. And I'm providing advice and support to countries. So that has been the journey and uh, I can speak a lot more, but I'm really uh, mindful about the time and uh, you know, happy to talk more. But every morning, uh, if you're motivated to get to work, no matter what you're doing and you love what you do, then you will obviously be successful. Uh, let me leave you with two thoughts. Uh, basically, uh, one of my uh, senior colleagues in the World Bank, when he was providing career counseling, uh, told me that a simple message said, Sharon, in public health, be a taxi, not a bus. Yeah, uh, it's very deep, actually. So basically, you know, in a bus, it's got a scheduled journey takes people from A to B. In a taxi, uh, a taxi driver has more control about their destiny in some ways, both provide a service. So uh, really the ability to control your destiny is important and to know yourself and to apply yourself to the context is really important. So colleagues, be a taxi, not a bus. Uh, secondly, uh, COVID-19 provides a huge opportunity, right? Uh, my, you know, the how popular public health has become is truly incredible. Uh, my parents can tell you the difference between vaccine efficacy and effectiveness today, just based on the Google stories, right? So it's such an incredible opportunity. And uh, you know, we know that a calamity is both a spur and a hint. So this is an opportunity, and I hope all of you take it with open arms. Uh, finally, colleagues, uh, you know, uh, the uh, one thing I would advise uh, very humbly is uh, it's important you know, as E.M. Foster has said, you know, you only need to connect the pros and the passion. Uh, if any of you have read Howard's End, which is a very good read. And uh, once you connect the pros with the passion, 
both will be exalted. What I mean here is simply get your passion, but also back it with expertise. And both are equally important for a successful, but importantly, also a fulfilling career. Finally, a big thank you to all. I'm really humbled by this opportunity and really great to see all of you. It's very emotional for me also. So, uh, but thank you so much. You are all in the best field of life, public health, community medicine. Uh, PSM used to be called the pain of studying medicine. Today, it is truly the pleasure of studying medicine. So colleagues with that, uh, wish you all the very best. Please feel free to reach out and I'm really humbled and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Shireen, for sharing your journey with us. I already know about you and what you have been doing <laughs> on all these years, but uh, it is very refreshing to hear from you one more time and highlighting the importance of learning all the time from every, in every opportunity, whatever you get, and highlighting working in challenge India is, you know, the best learning you get. You know, I sometimes I tell my students when they ask me uh, what to do after the course, and sometimes I suggested that, you know, you should work in areas where you need it. And some of them told me that Bihar is the best place to learn because it is a difficult place. And I think uh, it is even true uh, today. So I think uh, uh, you show that how even in countries, wherever you have been working, very difficult circumstances. So you have taken very challenging jobs. So thank you very much. And with you, we thank all the panelists for sharing their professional life and some of their challenges. Uh, we have uh, asked the participants to pose some questions uh, but I think not many questions. Uh, your, uh, you, you have, you had been very, uh, you have explained everything very clearly. It seems, uh, but even if there are few questions, I pass on to Abhishek. And from my side, thank you very much for taking time at very odd hours. I think this is, uh, this must be early in many countries. <laughs> Uh, so one more, one once more, I thank all the panelists from my side. Uh, Abhishek, take over, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, are there any questions uh, um, for yes, any of the panelists? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Dr. Arun Mitra, uh, can I uh, uh, ask yes, my yes. question? Yes. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to thank uh, MGMS Sevagram and. Uh, uh, all the team members for conducting this uh, amazing uh, event. Actually, it's a eye opener for us, and it's a very uh, good opportunity for us to interact with you because uh, it's very difficult for us to get all of you at one uh, stage. So um, uh, today I had a very uh, you know uh, revealing uh, experience by listening to everybody's talk, even uh, starting from Dr. Shastri's to uh, now Dr. Sharin's uh, talk, and uh, the way he summed up. Uh, saying uh, you need to be unique, you need to be original, and you be a uh, taxi, not a bus. Uh, that actually uh, gave it, it's a very good analogy for us, uh, you know, to be adaptable and, you know, to overcome hurdles and don't take the stipulated path that the bus route is, you know, you have to sometimes, you know, be a little pragmatic on your approach. So, uh, uh, firstly, uh, okay, I'll just come to my question. My question is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I've heard all of you talk and uh, I've, uh, you know, I really respect all of you as, you know, teachers and uh, gain a lot of motivation from you. But uh, the question I uh, really face uh, is that, you know, how uh, you know, we all see uh, the uh, fundamental assumptions of public health and medicine changing day by day, right? Uh, we were uh, uh, in the notion that, uh, you know, when Aristotle first came up with this theory of you know, heart being something divine. And then when William Harvey has, you know, come up and said that, you know, heart is actually a mechanical pump that actually, you know, pumps the blood that put an end to the, you know, bloodletting and the galenic practices of phlebotomy. Right. Now, coming uh, to this era, uh, we, uh, whatever public health has 
been till now and shaped has been been a little you know western oriented uh, that's what i feel when it comes to how medical education in india has actually taken uh, shape so uh, we also now see uh, how uh, you know the advances on new, you know new neurocognition and uh, other sciences reveal that you know there is a lot of uh, you know thing that we really don't know when it comes to indigenous medicine systems even ayurveda for example uh, so uh, and it's a very exciting time that you know we can still come back to the drawing board with newer methods uh, such as you know uh, data science approach uh, machine learning and algorithms that can actually reveal some kind of you know hypothesis and uh, let us test this kind of you know phenomenon that we're experiencing that the challenge that i want to uh, you know what i'm trying to get at is you know uh, as a young researcher or as a person who is looking up to all of you i want some kind of direction right i'm looking for uh, a kind of uh, uh, you know a space where uh, uh, i'm uh, you know challenged but you know i'm also given some kind of guidance uh, so uh, what do you think india you know where india is in terms of being adaptable and becoming the taxi in maneuvering what the future lays for us you know the data science approach and you know where the public health cadre is uh, right now do you think uh, we really have to uh, you know struggle a little more to get there or do you think the government is taking good enough steps or do you think what as uh, you know if you are respond you are uh, you know it's in your hands what do you like to see the change happen to be that's my question to all of you thank you uh i would uh, rather say that this is not your question this is your comment and uh, <laughs> this it requires a very long discussion uh if anyone any of the panelists can have a very short answer to this then it's okay so anyone would like to have a very brief short because we are we have passed the time but this is a very a very uh, uh, important question any panelists would like to take up dr rajesh this is arvind uh, i agree that it is quite um, uh quite elaborate if i think any one of us try to attempt i can just only submit it for anybody else be the change you want to see uh that's what uh, comes from the the land of gandhi and i think why why not i mean if you are interested in exploring newer paths uh and in the areas which are less traveled with some of us have done so so dr arun don't wait just start just look into start exploring be focused i mean like that's important for us to to remind everyone and i mean like it is important for us to also keep in mind that we should also be you know like hearing our um, gut feeling at times and the, the the voice of the heart uh to do and what not to do so i would just stop at that and then probably have a further uh and one session itself on the question you have asked actually so thank you and over to you okay yeah maybe we we have one last question uh, i think many of the post graduate students they want to know uh, what is the key to find a job in unicef or who <laughs> so sirin can you throw some light on that <laughs> uh, i was following people you know footprints on the sands of time and uh, dr arvin mathur uh i was really following his footprints when i journeyed on this path but uh and uh, so uh, so dr arvin the, it would be impossible if you don't come in after <laughs> i speak so please uh, feel free to chime in so uh so colleagues uh, i think firstly uh, uh you know it it's important to uh, aspire to work in these organizations but uh, and i'm i'm being very honest with you after having worked in these organizations and with with all due respect right uh, they they are wonderful organizations they help in shaping policy but they are not the end so it's very important to explore your horizon it is true a few years ago these were wonderful you know looking like uh, you know wonderful places like that city on the hill but uh, it's important that you broaden your horizons and there are wonderful opportunities all around 
Now, for in these organizations, of course, it's important to build a profile about yourself. And I would uh, humbly suggest that it's important to start at, uh, at a level where uh, you can learn the organization. All organizations, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, come with a certain level of bureaucracy. And it's important to understand the bureaucracy along with what you technically provide. So it's a mix of those two. Uh, so I'm, again, I'm saying that it's great to aspire to be in these organizations and uh, you know, happy to provide any, uh, have a bilateral chat with anybody who's interested as well, but broaden your horizon. In today's world, there are so many opportunities as some of the other panelists have shared to do great things. And, uh, you know, so it's important to focus on all the possible opportunities. Uh, let me uh, really hand the floor to Dr. Arvind on this one as well. Dr. Arvind. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shreen. And I must say it is so humbling when you say that. And it's been uh, really um, equally emotional, Shreen, to see you and being in the, co uh, in the panel. Uh, certainly reminded me of the good old days. Uh, just quickly, Dr. Rajesh, on this particular question from this young person and reiterating what Shireen had said, uh, you know, like it is absolutely critical again that do not consider these organizations as end of your, uh, you know, aspiration of both in terms of learning and achieving uh, the kind of a career goal. And the reason I'm saying so, I you know, unless and until you keep motivating yourself, uh, I I can say, uh, in fact, um, um, I remember even with Dr. Shastri, you know, had it not been um, probably his supervisor who didn't agree to let him go, uh, you know, we wouldn't have a scientist of the word repute that we have today uh, because he was almost slated and ready to join the WHO. Uh, to be as a member of the WHO family. So please understand that it is not one, I mean, I'm not saying that do not aspire. I'm certainly not saying that do not look for these job opportunities, certainly do. And for doing so, uh, you know, like it's a very competitive world. And so again, what I think many of us have said, be different. And I said it in, in the beginning in the early times with regard to saying that, if the age is not on your side, be the knowledge, be the your core partner, you know, like let the experience, let the qualification speak, let the publication speak, uh, let the work speak for you. Uh, and, you know, like I can say very proudly, Shireen is a good example for that, who led it like that even during the time uh, that he was in UNICEF, he was working to publish. And that is a passion that one carries even, you know, like, as of uh, this year, while we are in the COVID, uh, I was publishing for national health accounts. So it is something which is what should drive you to be very different and to be also acquiring some of the things which we generally don't talk much in the community medicine on the softer side uh, of our, uh, you know, like be it the communication, the softer skills that we talk about, uh, the art of public speaking, the networking, the relationship building, you know, all of those things which we are saying that you acquire concurrently, uh, and that's where the conferences play a role, uh, networking play a role, where you could learn in the current times, even the online webinars that Dr. Uh, Dr. Madhwani said or Dr. Shastri offered, the fellowships and other things, you know. So, you know, again, one-to-one -one, bilaterally would be more than happy. Uh, be on the look for these announcements, uh, both at national level as well as international level. Uh, but also do not consider that if you are not going there and or if that is one thing, because that's why you joined it as a public health, please don't make it your goal like that. Make your goal of uh, learning and contributing uh, and excelling. That's what I say in any field, in every walk of life, just strive for excellence and be better. And you would reach there, be it this organization or any other. There are huge opportunities in the world today. It's unparalleled. Thank you, and over to you, Shireen. Good to have interacted. Thanks, Atan. Can I get uh, thank, uh, just thank, uh, you uh, thank you very much? Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Rajesh Kumar, uh, sir, just a few seconds. Uh, we have 
now just a couple of seconds <laughs> just a couple of just, seconds uh, if you can finish in 30 seconds mm -hmm. that's well done. so i just want to uh, you know tell all our colleagues uh, here particularly the younger generation that you know today's world is publish or perish so you can do great amount of work you can do so many good things but it will be known only in your small well around you if you want the whole world to know, then you have to publish, publish, and publish. So that's why the adage comes up as publish or perish. Uh, in today's times, any international organization wants to hire you. The first thing they'll pull up is your Google profile, Google Scholar profile. And Google Scholar profile talks about uh, all your publications, the number of citations your publications are required, uh, have acquired. Those are the things that people look for when they are hiring. So. Have a Google Scholar profile, have plenty of publications and such publications which would be cited uh, across by people. So that's that's my uh, you know little bit uh, that you that could be helpful to you. Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to very, add very, very uh, one comment. That today yes. I have discussed that during a post graduation, you can decide whether you want to private practice. Join UNICEF and do research, do something in onco research, like our seniors have been doing. Whether you want to take occupational health as a career, or you want to start your own company with your passion, become a passionpreneur, become an entrepreneur. The opportunities are great. So take the plunge, get into the pool, take the first step. When you take the first step, you will see that the path is visible to you. Now you have to select carefully where you need to go to achieve the best. Keep on learning. And as Dr. Mathur said, be better, excel, and God bless. Thank you. One, one last, yeah, I uh, think... one last uh, you know, 20 seconds, if Dr. Rajesh Kumar can give me that. This is uh, Himan. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, just, just, uh, just, just a on. very quick comment. And the comment is that, uh, you know, you will have difficulties. Everyone has difficulties. But never be afraid of the challenges. Take them, and you know there is there is a couplet by uh, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, the one who gave us Sare Jahan Se Acha. Uh, the couplet says, "Baade bad mukam se kyun ghabarata hai akhar?" It says, "Hey eagle, why are you afraid of the wind blowing in opposite directions?" Ye to tez chalti hai tujhe uncha udane ke liye. So, so please. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think this uh, sums up uh, very well. I think Sir, your voice is breaking a lot. One has to see, uh, you know, she don't four walls, and there are many people you can seek guidance from. I hand over to Abhishek. Out of thanks, Abhishek. I think Bandhu. Abhishek, you Thank you, sir. Uh, and yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I think we would all have loved uh, to ask more questions uh, uh, to the panelists, but in the interest of time, uh, we'll uh, stop here. But uh, may I, on behalf of uh, some of the delegates uh, who are dropping those WhatsApp messages, uh, 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 I seek your consent that they may approach you over emails uh, to ask some of their questions, if that is acceptable Absolutely. to the panelists. 
absolutely yeah. anytime yeah. yeah thank you so much sir absolutely. for that and i think uh, yeah uh, all of them i mean uh, it, this this has been uh, uh, a revelation uh, to be able to hear from each one of you uh, the kind of paths that you all have treaded and the things that you have been able to achieve and i think uh, the overall uh, lessons that uh, uh, we could draw from each of your stories uh, 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 we'll try and assimilate those lessons and uh, that should def definitely uh, uh, guide us in the path that uh, the young postgraduates and the young faculty of uh, community medicine uh, want to tread in the future uh, I understand it's very odd hours uh, for some of you. Uh, so thank you, thank you each one of you, uh, Shastri sir, Heman sir, Madhwani sir, uh, uh, Sharin sir, and uh, Arvind sir. Uh, I mean, uh, I was uh, like one of the panelists, uh, one of the uh, delegates asked a question. Even uh, we were very hesitant to write to you uh, <laughs> to be a panelist for this particular session, and we never expected uh, such a warm uh, response from each one of you. Uh, uh, I mean, it was, nobody took a second email, and I think uh, the kind of uh, agreement and the kind of enthusiasm that uh, you are still uh, displaying uh, to answer or to take questions uh, from the delegates, uh, uh, that itself shows how much committed you are to nurture the future uh, generation. Heman uh, Kulkarni sir, I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, we have one undergraduate batchmate of yours who is attending our uh, panel discussion today. Uh, the moment he saw your name as a panelist, uh, as a panelist, uh, he gave me a call saying, uh, uh, Dr. Heman Kulkarni is my batchmate. So uh, he is here and he has just typed a message uh, for you. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so it's it's been a pure privilege to be able to listen to each one of you and your stories and the learnings will remain with us uh, for long. And uh, thank you, Rajesh, sir. Uh, I mean, uh, like I've personally communicated to Rajesh sir uh, and uh, Chandrakant sir uh, while communicating or while corresponding to with each one of you one of the key lessons uh, for people like me is uh, how to engage with the younger generation so it's not just uh, your work uh, but then uh, uh, it's a lesson for almost anybody all almost all everybody from our organizing team uh, regarding the softer skills that each one of you was talking about uh, and how to engage with the younger generation uh, how to motivate them, how to network. Uh, so it's a privilege uh, being connected to all of you. Thank you, thank you all of you. And uh, we are truly indebted uh, to have uh, and to be able to uh, hear from each one of you in this particular panel. And uh, sorry, this was our first event that we were conducting uh, virtually online. So some uh, mismanagement uh, regarding uh, time has happened, okay. uh, but then we all learn from uh, our experiences. Thank you. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, sir. Uh, I mean, uh, I've just, I'd had just heard uh, you, you're a fantastic speaker and I was able to witness it today. Uh, Shastri, sir, your energy is still the same. I mean, uh, what I saw around 20 years back when I was doing my uh, UG in KEM, uh, so you still have the same enthusiasm and vigor to engage uh, with uh, uh, the students and uh, everybody else. So thank you, uh, thank you all of you. Thanks a lot. Subodh sir, yes. Uh, Subodh sir is wanting to say something. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Just I wanted to say thank you. It was inspirational, and uh, 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 you are doing such wonderful work. Thanks a lot for accepting our invite.